Very few scientific discoveries receive widespread public interest, but the gene editing technique known as CRISPR-Cas has been the subject of intense public discussion. The idea of being able to directly manipulate the genome of living organisms, including humans, evokes feelings of excitement, anticipation, and concern. CRISPR-Cas is the science that will give us the ability to cure rare and common diseases, including AIDS and cancer. It allows us to increase agricultural yield in the face of a changing climate, to revive extinct species, get rid of malaria, or even enhance human health and longevity. When it comes to genetic technology, most people are quick to form an opinion or stick to a position. But how many of us have actually dusted the biology books and gone deep into the new scientific findings in order to fully understand this new technology with its potentials and its limitations? Shouldn't understanding be the basis of any debate or discussion? This technology has the potential to change humanity in profound ways. Isn't it worth truly knowing what is happening before public opinion once again shapes public policy in ways that hinder rather than facilitate progress? There are so many questions about gene editing and specifically CRISPR. What is it? How does it work? What has it already been used for? What are the potential and promising applications? What are the dangers? Are designer babies a real thing? How do we deal with all of this? As always on Rational Mind, let's begin by taking a step back and grasping all the fundamental concepts. Before talking about gene editing, we need to have clear in mind what genes are and how they work. A gene is simply a portion of DNA, which is the very long molecule encoding all the blueprint of a living organism. Each link in the long DNA chain contains one of four bases, A, T, C, or G. The way these letters are sequenced encodes the information needed to make proteins. A gene is then a portion of the DNA containing a complete sequence of instructions for making a specific protein. Proteins are the building blocks and the messengers of cells, which in turn are little machines and building blocks making up tissues and organs and entire organisms. DNA molecules are arranged in chromosomes, which are contained in the nucleus of each cell in an organism. Cells are like little factories where instructions are read from the DNA and new proteins are made according to the instructions. The DNA is read by the RNA, which is a molecule similar to the DNA but shorter, which can transcribe the sequence of letters from the DNA and then translate it into a protein. How does the RNA know what to read and what proteins to make? How does the cell know that it is a brain cell or a liver cell if each cell contains the whole genome for the organism? Thanks to the epigenome, a set of markers for the gene, the epigenome tags which genes in a cell should be switched on or off, which determines how and when they should be made. So in summary, a gene is the set of instructions for a protein, and genes are all linked together in a long DNA molecule arranged in a chromosome. The complete set of chromosomes containing all the genes of an organism is known as the genome of the organism. The human genome is composed of 23 chromosome pairs containing up to 50,000 genes encoded in as many as 3 billion DNA bases. Sequencing the genome means being able to read and record in order each of the 3 billion A, T, C and G letters encoding the genome. Luckily, DNA sequencing techniques have made incredible advances in the last decade, and we are now able to rapidly sequence DNA using sequencing machines. To put the progress into perspective, it took the Human Genome Project, an international effort, from 1990 to 2003 to sequence a generic human genome. We can now sequence any genome of a specific individual organism in a few hours using a machine. DNA sequencing is an essential breakthrough which facilitated the rise of gene editing, as it provides a map of the genome we want to edit. Having a map is not sufficient to know what each gene does, but it is of great help. By observing what genes are absent or present in individuals affected by a disease, for example, we can figure out what genes cause that particular disease. 
The discovery of the gene editing techniques known as CRISPR-Cas9 happened as many scientific breakthroughs almost serendipitously. In 2012, biologists Jennifer Doudna and Emmanuel Charpentier were investigating the immune system of yeast bacteria. A bacterium is simply a single cell organism. Even if very tiny, these organisms have evolved a system to fight viruses. A virus is not per se a living thing. It is simply a protein vessel containing a piece of genetic material, like a piece of DNA or RNA, with instructions to replicate itself. When the virus gets in contact with the host cell, it transmits its piece of genetic material to the cell, tricking it into making more of the virus. But some bacteria have figured out a way to protect themselves from viruses. When these bacteria are exposed to the DNA of a virus, they keep the foreign piece of DNA for future reference. A copy of this foreign DNA is stored in clustered, regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats, or CRISPR. These are basically sequences of DNA bases which are mirrored and repeated so that they can be easily differentiated by the rest of the cell's genome. What Doudna and Charpentier figured out was that a particular protein called Cas9 carries one such copy of CRISPR in the form of guide RNA, a piece of RNA describing the virus from a previous infection. This protein searches around the cell for DNA matching the guide RNA, and when it finds a match, it performs a cut onto the DNA strand at the precise point instructed by the guide RNA, effectively neutralizing that gene and neutralizing the virus. So CRISPR was originally evolved in nature by bacteria to serve as a kind of adaptive immune system to fight against viral infection. So when a virus tries to infect a bacterial cell, uh, the virus injects its DNA or RNA into the bacterial cell. And the cell may die as a result, or it may survive. But the beauty of the CRISPR system is that cells that survive viral infection record a little memory of that infection by incorporating a little piece of viral DNA or RNA sequence into the program that directs CRISPR uh, to cut DNA. So as I think uh, you know, CRISPR is a pair of molecular scissors that cuts DNA. But it doesn't cut DNA randomly. It cuts DNA at a programmed position, at a programmed sequence of DNA letters. The Eureka moment that earned the two scientists the 2020 Nobel Prize came when they realized that they could put any guide RNA sequence in the Cas9 protein, not only the RNA of a virus, meaning that they now had the ability to go and cut any gene at any point in the long DNA molecule of the organism with incredible precision and ease. Once the biologists figured out how CRISPR worked, um, then uh, they began to repurpose it to cut DNA sequences of our choosing, not the viral DNA sequences that natural bacteria CRISPR systems use to protect against viral infection. And so the the first paper that sort of married uh, the concepts of CRISPR biochemistry and gene editing uh, was the seminal paper by uh, Emmanuel Charpentier, Jennifer Doudna, and their co-workers, uh, which was recognized with the Nobel Prize in Chemistry last year, showing how you could reprogram uh, a CRISPR system to cut a DNA sequence of your choosing rather than a viral DNA sequence, simply by changing that guide RNA in, in the right way. Thanks to the work of Fang Zheng, this method was extended to application in any living mammalian cell, including human cells. DNA gets broken all the time in nature, like when we're exposed to UV light or to some specific chemicals. For this reason, all organisms have the ability to repair DNA, in one of these repair mechanisms, the broken DNA tries to repair by rejoining the broken ends. In this process, small local errors are introduced, causing that particular gene to be deactivated. This makes CRISPR-Cas a very effective method for deactivating a deleterious gene, 
for example, a gene associated with the disease. Another natural DNA repair mechanism works by searching for nearby DNA and copying it to fill the gap at the location the cut was performed. The interesting thing is that when performing a gene edit with CRISPR-Cas, not only we can choose the location where we want to cut, we can also provide synthetic DNA to be copied at the location of the cut, effectively replacing a gene we don't want with a gene we do want. Pretty incredible. Some seminal research by Maria Jason and other scientists discovered uh, decades ago that another consequence of cutting a, a DNA chromosome into two pieces is that you can stimulate processes that occasionally will grab a foreign piece of DNA and use it to replace the DNA sequence around the cut site. That process is called HDR or homology directed repair. And it can be used in some situations to replace one DNA sequence for another, which is very useful. Now that we have all the tools to understand how gene editing works, let's see some existing and potential applications and the wider scientific and moral implications that come with them. While well, DNA sequencing gives us a map of the genome, understanding what a gene does is a lot more complicated than just having a map. Being able to deactivate any gene allows us to test what they do, alone or in combination. Many diseases are monogenic, meaning they are associated with the presence of a single gene. Deactivating that gene means curing the disease. So CRISPR scissors are very good at cutting DNA to disrupt genes. And that can be quite useful, even for therapeutic purposes, in those cases where messing up a gene can have a therapeutic benefit. But for most genetic diseases that we know about, uh, simply messing up a gene isn't likely to benefit patients. And instead, you need to precisely correct the mutation that causes the disease, changing it back to a normal sequence or to something that is near normal. And uh, that's where other gene editing methods are particularly useful. Many of them build on CRISPR. Uh, they include base editing and prime editing. So base editing makes four kinds of single letter DNA swaps. It can change a C into a T, or a T into a C, or an A into a G, or a G into an A. And those four single letter swaps turn out to account for almost one third of known disease causing mutations. So a base editor doesn't cut the DNA double helix. It doesn't mess up genes, but it can precisely fix a mutation that causes a gene, uh, causes a genetic disease when that mutation is one of those four kinds of single letter swaps. And then prime editors, the newest general form of human cell gene editing technology can make any kind of base to base swap all 12 possible base substitutions in isolation or in combination. It can, prime editing can also make small insertions and small deletions. And so prime editing has this remarkable versatility in that it can make just about any kind of small DNA change very precisely without cutting the DNA double helix, without messing up the gene. Uh, and, and that kind of versatility has the theoretical possibility of correcting about 90% of the known disease-associated mutations, which are these base-to-base -base swaps, these small insertions, these small deletions, and combinations thereof. Given that CRISPR gives the ability to perform these edits in a living organism, including adult humans, we now have gene therapies for sickle cell disease, muscular dystrophy, and cystic fibrosis. Likewise, we could potentially cure thousands of rare single gene diseases, 95% of which currently have no cure. This alone makes CRISPR an incredibly valuable technology. But the most common diseases that kill most people are actually more complex and polygenetic, meaning that they are caused by the interaction of several genes and other factors. While we do have the ability to manipulate any gene, we're still lacking the understanding of how complex traits arise from the interaction of multiple genes. In fact, we do not know what most genes do. Gene editing does not come without any risks. Um, the reason that we really need to be careful is because these changes are permanent. 
which means that you can't change them in any capacity after. So there's two reasons why that's important and things we need to consider. The first is off-target edits. So off-target edits are unintended consequences to the genome. This is obviously something we're consistently monitoring. It's very important to investigators, scientists, and investors in the space. The other challenge that I think is worth mentioning is that we don't fully understand enough of the biology. Meaning, if you get rid of a gene, it's never really happened before. So we can look at studies where sometimes people don't have a gene and they seem to be fine without it. But it is important to remember that we're still learning so much about biology and there's still so much we don't know. So it is possible that getting rid of a gene could have some unintended consequences that we don't fully comprehend yet. Genes that are responsible for disease are often useful to the organism in other ways and cannot be simply deactivated or replaced. Great care must be exercised when modifying the genome until a complete understanding is achieved of what everything does. But CRISPR has great potential even in the treatment of the more complex diseases by following a different approach. For example, cancer arises from a wide and complex set of causes, so we cannot manipulate all the genes at the root of cancer yet. But we can manipulate the immune system to better target and eliminate potential tumors. This is done by using CRISPR to edit the genome of T cells, the immune cells responsible for detecting and attacking the tumor. The CRISPR edit makes them more effective at their job. So CAR T therapy, uh, as an example, it, you go through apheresis as a patient, which basically means that you get a blood test and then that blood is gonna be separated. And so different things will come out of that blood. For this particular instance, you're interested in the T cells. So we separate the T cells from the blood. We make uh, those targeted cells. We genetically modify them into cancer killing cells. And then we harvest those cells and infuse them back into a patient. Gene editing also holds promise for the prevention and cure of HIV AIDS. T cells play a fundamental role in the functioning of our immune system. And so when the HIV virus infects them, the immune system shuts down. This eventually causes the death of the subject from other infections. Experiments are underway to gene edit T cells to protect them from HIV, which could potentially prevent AIDS. Additional medical applications include the more precise targeting of infectious diseases by being able to specifically cut and deactivate the genome of a single type of bacterium. This is important because right now most infections are fought with broad spectrum antibiotics, which, as the name suggests, kill a large spectrum of different bacteria, including the ones that are good for you. And because antibiotics have been used for a long time now, many bacteria have adapted and cannot be killed by general antibiotics. Being able to create a specific antibiotic that targets only the intended bacteria is an incredible step forward in the fight against infectious diseases. There are innumerable additional medical applications. For example, as of today, there are way more people needing organs than there are organ donors, resulting in waiting lists that are sometimes years long. People have always wanted to transplant animal organs into humans. Now, the problem with doing so is that it's possible that animals like pigs will have remnant ancient viral infections, um, which will do a lot of harm to a human if uh, their organ is implanted into them. So scientists have actually been able to use CRISPR gene editing to create healthy pigs that don't have any trace of any ancient virus so that potentially these can be uh, transplanted into humans. As we know, this is a very huge unmet need. So in the US, every day, there's approximately 22 people who need an organ transplant that die because they haven't gotten it yet. So this could pretty much save countless people if effective. Outside the medical field, there are many applications of CRISPR. The largest of these is in agriculture. In fact, agriculture is the field where CRISPR technology can be deployed fastest with crops that are more climate proof, resistant to drought, to storms, and to pests, needing no pesticides and increasing food security. Plants can be made more nutrient efficient, which reduces the need for fertilizer. Plants can be gene edited to have longer shelf life, which reduces food waste. CRISPR can be used to make hornless cows, increasing animal welfare as horns often result in injury. 
With gene editing, we can create beef cattle that only produce males for more efficient feed to meat conversion, or chickens that only have female offspring for egg laying. All of this would increase yield and give the ability to produce more food without converting more natural habitats into farmland. It will also feed more people and provide increased food security, especially in poor countries, which are the most affected by climate change. So CRISPR could expand that ag market to about 170 billion by 2025. And that we're talking about in terms of crops, in terms of livestock, in terms of aquaculture. There could also be 585 trillion uh, increase in calorie production, which would feed an additional 800 million people by 2025. In developing countries, large numbers of people are affected by diseases such as malaria. This could be eradicated with CRISPR by eliminating the vectors of the disease, such as malaria-carrying mosquitoes. This would be done via a technique known as gene drive, which means that a specific genetic mutation is driven into a whole population. For example, a few mosquitoes could be edited to only have male offspring and released to the environment, eventually wiping out the whole population of mosquitoes. Alternatively, Hereditary traits could be introduced making the mosquitoes immune to the malaria parasite. But wait a second, does this mean that edited genes are hereditary and passed on to offspring? So far, we've been mainly talking about applying CRISPR techniques to somatic cells, which are fully developed mature cells in living organisms. These traits are not passed on to the offspring, but CRISPR can also be applied to germ cells, such as embryonic cells, the distinction is very important and with huge implications. Gene editing applied to embryos, also known as germline editing, is not only permanent throughout the life of the organism, but it is also passed on to its offspring, making it hereditary. So when we edit the human germline, which is most commonly done by editing a human embryo, then we are imposing that edit on all the descendants of the resulting person. And, and that's a weighty proposition for at least a couple of reasons. First, all of this is pretty new and our understanding of how an edit affects a person and what potential unforeseen consequences of the editing procedure might affect the person, our understanding is incomplete. So, there are always risks associated with, uh, well, with any medical intervention, and especially with, with ones as new and cutting edge as gene editing. Somatic cell editing is a very different prospect. That's one where a patient with a genetic disease can, in an informed way, understand this is the consequences of my disease. So for that reason, many in the science and ethics community draw a sharp distinction between editing the somatic cells and editing the germline. And, you know, most approach germline editing with extreme caution for good reasons. After discovering the CRISPR method for gene editing, Jennifer Dudna called for a global moratorium, a pause on clinical experiments applying CRISPR to human embryos. And this is for a very important reason. CRISPR makes it possible to edit any gene in the human genome with astounding precision and notably with incredible ease. This is a huge leap forward from previous genetic engineering techniques, which were very complex, long and costly, meaning only a few major labs could perform them, and still without the level of precision of CRISPR. On the theoretical level, being able to manipulate the genome so easily means that anyone could attempt editing human traits on themselves or others, not only by eliminating disease, but also by introducing desirable qualities, for example, stronger bones, a certain eye color, no boldness, more strength, and perhaps even more intelligence. But while we now do have the tool to perform these modifications, we do not yet know which genes do what. We don't really know what DNA changes contribute to those traits. And the reality is those traits are likely to be so complex that the contribution of hundreds, if not thousands of genes, as well as your environment, uh, end up determining how intelligent you are, if that can even be defined in a convenient way, um, uh, you know, what your athletic ability is, how tall you are, etc. So I don't think we are close to a situation where 
um, effective designer babies uh, is in the realm of, of possible. Uh, instead, I think the bigger concern is that people through a misunderstanding, thinking that they can make themselves smarter or run faster or whatever through gene editing will try kind of reckless experiments. Uh, but in my opinion, because gene editing still requires a lot of effort and resources to perform, especially on a person, uh, it will be reserved for the short term, medium term, and maybe for the foreseeable future to correct serious genetic problems. Uh, I don't think it will be used uh, anytime soon for vanity purposes on healthy individuals, simply because the risk and the resources don't make sense to apply it in that way. And because gene edits at the embryonic level persist into future generations, these are particularly risky without a full understanding of the implications. So the era of custom edited human embryos or designer babies is very far away and any use of CRISPR technology for this purpose is considered unethical by the entire scientific community. This is why when in 2018 Chinese scientist He Zhang Koi CRISPR the genomes of human embryos, it raised worldwide controversy. He eventually received a prison sentence and a large fine. Unfortunately, cases like this cast the entire field in a negative light. But these issues only exist with germline editing. There are no such risks associated with somatic gene editing. And of even lower risk is epigenetic editing. So when you think about applying epigenetic modification, which means changing which genes are turned on and turned off and to what extent, I think the sweet spot for epigenome modifying technologies are uh, therapeutics or research needs where temporarily turning on or turning off genes, or maybe turning them on or off for a long period of time, but without changing the genome is, is the best way to cause the cell to change its state or to change the way it signals. Unlike gene editing, epigenetic editing can be undone at a later time. This already has applications, for example, in making military personnel or first responders more resilient to radiation. Once discharged from duty, these effects can be turned off. While gene therapy holds great promises for the future of healthcare, it is still very expensive. This is for a few reasons. Firstly, even though CRISPR itself is a simple and cheap technology, Delivering CRISPR to the cells in the body that need to be edited is a bit more challenging. For this reason, the most promising initial applications for CRISPR are in the treatment of blood-related diseases, such as sickle cell anemia, as it is easier to deliver the gene therapy to the bloodstream and the blood cells than it is to deliver it to solid tissues in the body. Secondly, CRISPR is well suited to the treatment of rare diseases and for precision, predictive, and personalized healthcare. It is now possible to imagine in the near future the ability for everyone to have their genome sequenced as part of their personalized medical record, with gene therapies developed specifically to prevent or to precisely target disease in a personalized way. However, until more infrastructure and economies of scale to support this shift in healthcare are developed, this approach will remain quite expensive. But this is a field that has seen dramatic reductions in cost in just a few decades. So sequencing the first human genome took around 13 years to complete and also uh, several billion dollars. However, now with the advances of technology, the increases of competition, we were able to sequence genomes in a few days and at a cost of sub a thousand or a few hundred dollars. New solutions for the cheap and effective delivery of CRISPR to the cells of the body are now on the horizon thanks to recent developments associated with the COVID vaccines. Traditional vaccines insert viruses, bits of viruses or dead viruses into the body to trigger an immune response and train the immune system to fight the virus. This would take years if not decades to develop as the virus had to be modified to become harmless. New vaccines work in a very different way by delivering messenger RNA instead of bits of viruses. The messenger RNA or mRNA 
instructs the body to make the same protein that would host the virus, only without the actual virus. This then triggers the immune system to respond and create defense. We have known about the possibility of doing this for a long time, but in the past, delivering mRNA to the cells was difficult because the immune system would destroy it and the cells wouldn't take it in. What is special about the new technology used to deliver mRNA to the cells is that it packages the mRNA into lipid nanoparticles, which can be injected with a needle and make their way to the cells. This is cheap, effective, and can be mass-produced. It proved a lifesaver technology for the COVID pandemic. So LMPs, or lipid nanoparticles, are used as a delivery vehicle. It's what's being used by Moderna and Pfizer and also other companies that still have their COVID-19 vaccines in production. So why is it so great? Well, it's made of lipids, which are essentially fat, they're biodegradable in the body, which is really important because you don't want that to stick around and cause any unintended consequences. So some gene editing bears, which mean people who were not very positive on gene editing, suggested that it would be really hard to get to mass adoption and mass scale for gene editing because we didn't have the expertise in mRNA and LMPs, what is used in the COVID vaccine. We didn't have the needed infrastructure for it. And so they thought, well, this could never really get to the scale that it needs to get to. However, with COVID, so many labs and scientists stepped up and got that expertise and also created that infrastructure. Pre-pandemic, during the pandemic, COVID was really the one that was focused on for LMPs and mRNA. We believe that in the endemic phase or in the phase following the pandemic, LMPs and mRNA are going to be really important for gene editing. This is also probably going to lead to a cost decline because procuring those raw materials that are needed for this form of gene editing may have been expensive before, but now may be in large supply. This technology has the potential to also deliver things other than vaccines, for example, gene therapies, by using mRNA with instructions for CRISPR gene edits. This would take the cost of a single gene therapy down from hundreds of thousands of dollars today to only between $20 and $40 a dose. This could also permit mass-scale campaigns for the treatment of diseases that affect the poorest countries, such as sickle cell disease and HIV in sub-Saharan Africa. It is always difficult to predict where science will be in the next decade. Just 10 years ago, if anyone said we would be able to precisely cut and edit any gene in our DNA, nobody would have believed it. But by observing nature, we found this amazing tool in the immune system of yeast bacteria. It is perhaps difficult to appreciate the paradigm shift that will result from this discovery in industries ranging from healthcare to agriculture but it is undeniably a massive leap forward for humanity. As with any technology, with huge power comes huge responsibility. But it is also important to fully understand the technology in order to form an opinion of it. It is important to truly assess as a society where the risks lie and how sizable the benefits are. And in the case of gene editing, it is important to understand the difference between germline gene editing, which becomes hereditary, and somatic or epigenetic gene editing, which affects only the individual. Understanding this enormous difference can help prevent the misunderstanding and demonization of a technology that can save millions of lives, feed a growing population with less impact on the environment, and make us all better off. If you would like to learn more about any of these issues, check out the link below or visit www.rationalmind.show for more information and resources.